Welcome to the June session of AZ Bio Peers. My name is Joan Kerber Walker. AZ Bio Peers is designed to bring together the members of Arizona's bioscience community so we can learn together and share best practices. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to George Kohlberg and he will introduce the today's topic and our speakers. George? Great, thank you, Joan. I'm George Kohlberg from Kalos Therapeutics. Um, today's uh, meeting is going to be very interesting. Most of us as entrepreneurs uh, are focused so much on our science or development, drug development, our device, that we don't think about all the moving pieces, no pun intended, that go on behind the scenes. Uh, in drug development, you have to be aware of manufacturing, the logistics, uh, the backup that's necessary, and all of those things that go into getting a product to market come from our speakers today. They, they're gonna cover logistics and manufacturing, the integration of human and animal healthcare and, and where the roads diverge. So this should be a very good conversation. Uh, one nice thread that runs through all of this is regulatory affairs. It's good to know the people you're working with, your CMOs, your CDOs, the logistics folks, your global manufacturing consultants and experts, so that you have someone who is a trusted uh, advisor as well as a person providing a service. Welcome, everybody, and I'm delighted to be here. And a special warm welcome to any uh, emerging entrepreneurs in the, in the crowd. Um, I own a logistics company, a third-party logistics company based in Indianapolis, Indiana. I started the business with my sister 25 years ago, 25 plus years ago, and uh, my brother uh, is, is very, very much involved too. Uh, we have 160 employees around the country, uh, six facilities in about a million square feet of warehousing. Uh, one of those facilities, I'm happy to say, is in Phoenix, Arizona. We've got 150,000 square feet of GMP space uh, where we store two to eight uh, ambient temp, two to eight C, negative 30 C storage, and uh, some negative 70 ULT freezers too. Nice. Uh, Langham works with a lot of great clients in pharma, but is also in automotive and retail and food. Uh, companies like Cummins Engine and Bridgestone Firestone and Toyota, as well as Amgen and Eli Lilly and, and smaller companies like Capsita and Medavent. And, and really the reason I even mention uh, automotive and non-pharma is because a lot of our pharma customers are interested lately in how other industries uh, think about automation and efficiency and that sort of thing, and are really looking for uh, some uh, advice and interest from the non-pharma companies. Perfect. Thanks, Kathy. Joanna? Yes, hi, um, I'm Joanna Ward, and I have a small uh, consulting company uh, where we focus on manufacturing and CMC issues in the biologics and small molecule field. My experience is 25 years plus in, in pharmaceuticals, uh, really starting at a small company and then taking products to market. And that's really where I can provide a lot of advice um, with managing contract manufacturing organizations, with regulatory affairs, and really just generally supporting the CMC issues for drug development. Excellent. Thank you very much, Joanna. Kristen. Yeah, thanks, George. <clears throat> so hello, everybody. So my name is Kristen Blank, and I'm the Vice President of Research and Exploratory Development at Elanco Animal Health. And Elanco Animal Health is a $4.7, $4.8 $4 dollar business. Um, we're number two, number three animal health company in the world. Um, we're present in over 100 countries. Um, and we have a really diverse um, portfolio of products um, and pipeline of R&D assets ranging from vaccines to nutritionals to small molecules. So really across all the different technology types um, and eager to find new technology types that help us um, serve both farm animals as well as pets. And so in our world, pets are dogs and cats and farm animals include anything that we potentially consume. So 
um, chickens, um, cattle, dairy and beef, um, swine, um, as well as aqua. So fish is actually a, a division of our company as well. And so, um, and we have a pretty vast network of internal research facilities um, and development capabilities and also outsourcing partners. Um, and that's very true for our manufacturing footprint as well. We have a lot of um, company owned um, manufacturing plants, but we also have a lot of um, CMO uh, relationships as well. And I think that's one of the things that's it, it's interesting in animal health is we can't possibly afford in the way that the animal health business structure works for us to own everything internally that we need. And I think, you know, human farm has been on its evolutionary pathway, um, but historically, at least very early, had frequently a very internally focused footprint. And what's interesting is most animal health companies grew up in that footprint. We grew up in Eli Lilly. We separated a couple of years ago. Um, Novartis had a similar journey. Bear Animal Health has just had a journey separating from parent um, actually into us. Um, and, and so but we have a nice blend in animal health. We just, we have to have that blend because we can't afford to own all of our manufacturing capabilities. We can't afford to own all of our R and D capabilities in house. So, so very excited to join you guys today because um, obviously on that note, um, interface with the biotech industry and the human biotech industry is actually quite important to us um, because there's a lot of opportunities and great science happening in human health. Um, that very much has nice applicability into our space. So, um, so we love to make that connection and hence the joke about bio. Um, bio is a great source for us every year um, to meet new companies. And um, my relationship with George is a good example of that as well. So we connected with Kalos at some point because there were maybe some synergies there. So great. So thank you. So with that introduction, let's explore some of these questions to the whole panel. Um, CDMO, CMO, manufacturing, what's more important, broad experience or very specific narrow experience and why? Uh, do you want an award? And I'll take this one, right? Um, my background obviously is in managing contract manufacturing organizations. And to address the question really, George, I think it depends on the uh, product and the, and the company and whether they want a fast timeline or they have time to develop things in a slightly slower progress. Some of the larger CMOs in the manufacturing arena really don't have um, a good experience at the cell line development, let's say, right? If you're talking biologics. And um, I often advise through my consulting company, uh, pick a, uh, a company that is very focused on cell line development so that you can really get a good cell line and then transfer it to a CMO. But there could be some situations where you just want to get to the clinic really quickly. And you know, in the future, you may want to change that cell line or the product might, might change. And in that case, you could go to a CMO that is an all encompassing and may not have some very specific experience at the, at the early stages. Um. Joanne, thank you for jumping in on the first question. Uh, panel, is there anyone else who would like to weigh in on that first thought of narrow or broad as far as what's better for the type of consultants you select? From, from a logistics company's perspective, really how we operate is providing validated WMSs, temperature and chain of custody security, uh, providing copies of deviations, cor corrective action reports, other reports that could provide evidence that we're functioning uh, within a, an appropriate quality system. Those, those are the kind of things our customers expect from us, providing copies of state licenses and permits and just really bottom line being transparent about all things quality and regulatory. Nice. You're literally paving the way. Kristen? Yeah, so maybe an, a, I'm going to take you off on a slight tangent here, but one of the things that's um, unique in the animal health industry um, is the fact that we, and I'll just use the U.S. to start and I'll talk a little bit globally, but in the U.S. will actually be playing to three different regulatory um, authorities. We actually have product in the EPA regulatory spat space, which will be topical um, parasiticides primarily, will be in the FDA CBM space, which is primarily our small molecules. 
And then the USDA covers animal vaccines as well as most immunomodulators, but there's a little bit of a turf war that occurs between the FDA and the USDA on that. So when we're looking at manufacturing partners, uh, CDMO sort of structures, um, one of our challenges routinely will be um, our, we have a limited um, ability because we'll find people that have never worked with EPA before or never worked with USDA before. Um, so we frequently find ourselves kind of charting new territory. Um, so, but I think, you know, to kind of echo Kathy's comment there is foundational elements. Well, first of all, they have to be willing, right, to, to work with and when we're able to actually have a suite, have a function that's going to work in their manufacturing plant that will work with our regulatory agencies. And of course, there's an approval process for that. We'd love for them to be set up and already approved. Um, but is foundational elements um, like quality control labs and documentation practices and, you know, are they running at human GMP, um, you know, consistently and what types of products, et cetera. Um, but, but very different sort of thing to think about in complexity, I would say in some regards um, in our world, because we do have different regulatory agencies in the United States. If we flip over into Europe, Europe, um, you know, EMEA, um, everything falls underneath the same regulatory agency. So much more simple in that regard. Um, that's true in most of our other Japan, Australia, Brazil, if we look at our other major, major geographies for animal health industry. Um, but the US is, is really complicated um, because of that three regulatory pathway sort of scenario. Very good point. I was shocked the first time I learned we had to go to the USDA for some of our ideas on the animal products. I was like, whoa, what do you mean yeah. they're going to eat them? No, that's yeah. wrong. Yeah, <laughs> well, and, and the thing that's super crazy about USDA is just 30 years ago. So back in the 80s, um, vaccines for animals um, were being approved by states only. Uh, there was not federal oversight on that. So super wild west just 30 years ago, actually. Um, on the animal vaccine space. So there's been a lot of progress, but it's still in the very, and USDA has a very different, um, it's not GMP, it's a USDA sort of defined quality system that needs to be in place. So you can't just simply assume, wow, I've got a really nice GMP plant, human um, processing. I mean, everything's up to GMP standards for the human that probably will work in, on for FDA for us, but very different requirements, not just like harder or easier, but just different for USDA. Um, so it's a really kind of a little frustrating, I would, I would say, in some regards. Agreed. A lot to learn there. Yep. Kathy, let's talk logistics. In this past year, I've learned more about logistics with what was necessary for deploying vaccines and getting them dispersed throughout the world. Why don't you fill us in? Because when I thought logistics, it, I only, I'm thinking trucks, you know, that's, move it from here to there. It seems there's a lot more in it than that. What, what can you tell us? Yeah, George, thanks for the question. Yeah, it's, it's a great uh, industry to be in right now. It's a great service to be able to provide. And for years, a lot of people thought logistics, I mean, everyone defines it differently and they still do. Uh, logistics was a, a brand new term maybe 15 years ago and, and we're still a bit confused. But a lot of people think it is just transportation and really it's all aspects of the supply chain. So especially our smaller uh, biotech companies, but really everybody, they are looking for how do I get it from the supplier into us? And like you said, especially in the last year, not just vaccines, but the whole supply chain has been uh, in turmoil uh, with with problems at the ports, countries shutting down, people not working. Uh, in the past when we thought, gosh, we need, you know, a three month supply of something, you know, whether it's vials or uh, raw materials, that's all we need to be ready for manufacturing. Well, now it's gone from three to six months to nine months. Uh, so in our business, really logistics means transportation. So it's international, air freight, uh, uh, ground freight, ocean, receiving, warehousing, pick and pack. Uh, one differentiator with Langham is that we do uh, GMP warehousing as well as temp controlled transportation. That's unusual in the market, but that is a big need. 
So customs clearance, uh, sampling, uh, expedited ground and air shipping, and all that has, you know, with the Suez Canal problems and with everything going on, it, it has really changed how we get product here. And uh, of course, in, not to mention the driver shortages and all that, that the prices have gone up. There are fewer drivers and it really has become as much science as art uh, to, to move product around the world and all our customers are finding it. And even these emerging companies, I think, you know, Capsita and Medavent are some of our smaller kind of new customers. And when they put their business plans together, they really, you know, didn't spend as much time thinking about where do we source this product and how long does it get to it take to get here and how do we store it before we can use it um, as, as they did, you know, doing what they do, you, you know, uh, creating uh, uh, life-saving drugs and, and saving children and all, all the things they're involved in but they uh, rely on companies like us, third-party logistics and transportation logistics experts to make sure we're taking care of all those pieces of the supply chain to make sure they're getting what they need. And of course, what we all want is getting product into patients. Got it. Thank you very much, Kathy. I'm gonna go slightly out of order. Joanna, um, you've been involved with so many areas of, of this process that Kathy shed a light on, Kristen shed a light on. You, you've touched on CMC, alliance management, global chain logistics. If we're not making product, we're not gonna get it to market. Tell us how you influence a biomed company's process. How do we put all these pieces together? And so I'll, I'll just toss that to you. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, it, it, that's a good start there, George. I think, um, Kathy's logistics uh, are very much forgotten in many companies, in startup companies. It's it's the afterthought. It's okay, I've got all this material in in big bottles. I've got to keep it frozen at minus 80. Oh my gosh, how am I going to ship it, right? And, and where am I going to store it in the interim before I get it into vials? Um, so what I try and do and work with, with companies on is setting that plan in place right from the beginning. Uh, when you're developing your drug, work out, you know, what is, what's going to be your storage condition? Where are your manufacturers? How are you going to ship it between site A and site B? Do you need interim storage? And really line up the full supply chain. It is a full supply chain. And that includes the logistics. Um, I also work in uh, the gene therapy world and uh, with autologous patients, with autologous therapies. And there, it's very much a, a logistics nightmare in many cases because some of those products have a 48 hour shelf life from the end of manufacturing to reinfusion uh, we would lean very heavily on drivers <laughs> kathy said you know there are there are drivers even so sort of vet fedex drivers are, are rare sometimes and specialty drivers to uh, act as couriers um, are also hard to find but we work through companies um, as well logistics companies that focus on those very special needs um, so, you know, you touched on a little bit on alliance management. It's a term that's used very much in the industry. If a small company is, has brought on a partner to take their product to market, to take it into the next steps of development, maybe they can't afford to manage European clinical trials. Um, and so from the CMC perspective, you're often right up front working with that partner in developing a global uh, strategy for manufacturing and supply. So there's there's many functions. Um, I think one of the areas we haven't touched on, and I think it applies also to the veterinary um, area for Kristen's um, area of expertise, is the final packaging and labeling um, and distribution to the clinical trials. Um, and that often, again, is, is an afterthought. It's like, oh gosh, now I've got this product. How am I gonna manage that clinical trial distribution? Um, logistics come in very heavily here, uh, getting it to labeling sites, and then also from those labeling sites, getting it to the, the trial sites. And that involves sometimes having depots, uh, especially in Europe, in each specific country that you have clinical tri trials running, like Russia and places like that. You have to establish those particular distribution depots. 
Great. So I'll, I'll, I'll breathe there and uh, let somebody else weigh in too, George. Uh, Kristen, the, Joanna just mentioned CMC, and that was, Kalos has always had an animal division internally, and other mm -hmm. companies are starting to pick that up here. Um, what is the biggest difference between moving your drug forward in animal health as opposed to human health? Kristen? Well, I would say, I mean, first of all, Matt, I guess I'd go back, I'll, I'll get back to the CMNC focus there in a minute, but, but one of the things that's really neat about animal health is the fact that you can get to your patient, um, your host animal, we'll call it, um, but your patient for all intents and purposes much earlier, you can get to them in the preclinical phase. And so, so we will, you know, identify molecule, identify antigen, um, you know, back early in our lead stage, we'll do a little lead optimization. We might do that in laboratory animal species, but then we are very quickly able to go to uh, research cats, research dogs, uh, cattle, uh, swine, fish, um, our host animal and do our proof of concept in those animals. Um, and so one of the things that we struggle with, um, now flipping to CMNC in particular, is enabling formulation, how fast do you invest in final formulation? Um, and because of course, um, and, and I'm a veterinarian and biologist coming to the table, not the chemist coming to the table or the molecular biologist who is, I'm eager to get it into the host animal and see the signal, see the efficacy signal, make sure we've got something looking safe, but I routinely have my chemist in my head saying, hey, but wait a minute, this is just an enabling formulation. Are we really sure, you know, should we do a little formulation work here and be working on our CMNC earlier? Um, and really sort of because recognize this is not our, you know, this is not the final state. This is not our final um, scale up of our, of our vaccine. Um, if we think large molecule, this is not our final MAB. Um, and so, so we have, that's a tension point in animal health. And so if you were partnering with an animal health company, that would be something really to talk about quite a bit is at what point, you know, based on what we know about this molecule, what do we, where do we deem, you know, how do we look at the risk profile of that? Is this an asset class that we're pretty comfortable with? We love it when in human health, it's out in a phase three and there's a CMNC package and, you know, drug product, drug substance, that's all been pretty well defined. Then we're like, you know what, we're probably good with enabling formulation back here, looking at a signal and then we're able to move fairly quickly. Um, if we're in a new asset class, yikes, maybe we need to do a little bit of um, work there to make sure that we don't have eight chiral centers and this thing's going to never be affordable in animal health and, and, and we really need to work on that. So, um, so that's, that's kind of a weird nuance in our space is um, thinking about that sort of exactly where is the right place to de-risk the CMNC. Um, um, and we typically ride on enabling formulations though in general until we get to development. But then as soon as we hit development, that's when we start spending the money on, on um, sort of what that final, that final look should start being. Um, but that's a good, and, and I'll, I'll even share a little bit of an interesting, Elanco Animal Health just purchased Bear Animal Health. Um, and it's been really one of the strengths of our coming together is I think Elanco, we tend to de-risk CMNC late. Bayer as a good chemistry focused company from their lineage was de-risking that earlier. And so it's been really kind of fun to relook at our whole pipeline and say, hmm, you know what, one size doesn't fit all here. We should probably be a little more deliberate, but, but you as a partner coming in, I think, you know, um, helping us stimulate that kind of conversation would be key in thinking about that. Very important, thanks. We also learned that different countries have different regulatory standards. If we yeah. wanna do something in China, well, it's gonna be much more like developing an animal drug. You've gotta get most everything done up front. It's not just the US that you've gotta be thinking about. Cross spe species going international, it's very, very different. Um, and to that end, I think our audience has some questions. Joan, could we get to a couple? Absolutely. Let me pop in here and join all of you. It's been a great discussion. Thank you so much, George, for putting this together and leading it. So one of the questions that came through the chat had to do with um, when you're picking your partners, what are some of the things that you need to be thinking about? Do you need to get references? Do you need to do site visits? What, what are some of those early steps that we should be thinking about? 
Uh, Joan, I can take this one. I can start this one. Um, so when we're looking for a CMO or a partner to do any manufacturing, obviously the first step is to get an RFP issued, right? That's a request for a proposal to find out really what their capabilities are and can they meet your requirements? Um, and then uh, do, an, do a site visit, meet the teams, meet the people that you'll be working with. Is it, uh, do they really have what you want? Are they people that you can work with closely? Um, and then if that goes successfully, you can start working through uh, the, the details of the project coming up and negotiations of your master service agreements and things, but also have a quality audit. Do not sign anything until you've had a, that quality audit. Um, mm -hmm. That's very critical to make sure that they can actually meet the quality requirements for the regulatory authorities. Excellent, Joanna. Anyone else on the panel want to weigh in on that one? In logistics what we care about most from our partners is this whole quality focus. I mean, they have to be very serious and uh, really good point about making sure there are site visits and audits like that, Joanne, I, I appreciate that. But we need that balanced with a level of technology and strategy. Uh, you, you know, for, for us, our customers expect us to deliver freight on time and get it through the warehouse. What they want from us, in addition to that, is uh, a, a business intelligence view of the business. So trending reports, uh, 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 dashboards that show them the bigger picture of what's going on. And we need strong partners to get all that done. So it is this great balance between quality and high service and technology. Kristen, Thanks. did you want to add something? Yeah, I think, you know, a couple things. I mean, and I, I think, I mean, Joan's, Joanne's example is perfect there, but, you know, underneath that quality audit is really um, deep, right? And so I think, you know, you might be hiring a consultant to do that for you um, as a small company, but I think, understanding that even just IT system controls um, and what's going on with how they're managing data within the plant, um, understanding their sourcing strategies, understanding maybe a relationship that they've had with the regulatory agencies, right? What is their audit history from the regulatory agencies? What relationship do they have? Because that's going to end up reflecting on you and your product um, and your relationship potentially. So there's just a lot of depth and a lot of areas there that um, I think it's good, even if you're hiring a consultant to do that for you, that you're fairly savvy about all the elements of that and, and what you wanna see. Thanks, Thanks Kristen. Um, George, the, um, the follow on question to that in the chat is, um, okay, now I've got my partnership and I'm moving things along um, how do I make sure that things stay on plan? I mean, we've seen even the biggest companies during the COVID vaccine scenario, you know, get called out um, when their subcontractors were not following the plan. How do you ensure that you maintain that quality that your supplier committed to? Joanna? Uh, yeah, so really with management, having the resources assigned to manage it on a daily day basis, really staying to, on top of the quality, um, questioning them, meeting frequently. And if there's any variance, really stepping on it straight away and doing deviations or whatever we need to do to, to control it. Um, and really making sure that you're a partner with your CD, CMO as well and making them part of the team um, so that it's not an, an outside arm working for you. It truly is, you know, bring them in and have them as, alongside you. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, we have a question from Stefan uh, Johnson at Calvary, and they, like several other companies in town that I know of, have decided to leverage their animal assets as well. What is the status of using GMP source material in human and animal clinical trials and as a product? So uh, to the panel, GMP source material. So, um, so from an animal health perspective, um, you, can, you can operate um, and push forward your 
projects um, really quite, quite successfully through pilot uh, phase um, in, without GMP material. And that's true across all of those platforms that I talked about um, in different agencies. Um, so you may successfully um, do pilot work even in client owned dogs and cats, horses, um, um, and obviously livestock. Um, you will have some issues with livestock being able to potentially still have them go to market. You'll have to work through that aspect. Um, so you may end up having to just euthanize and, and have animal waste, unfortunately. Um, and have them not end up in the food chain, but that depends a little bit. And then that is a whole different conversation that would take too much long, too much time to talk about today. But, but um, in general, you can, you can work that. Once you get into your pivotal phase in general across the agencies, you're gonna need to have GMP material or USDA approved um, 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 scheme um, for your material. Um, but that's that, in a nutshell, that's how animal health uh, works. In Europe, same. Japan, Australia, basically the same. So as I think about other regulatory agencies across the major geographies, yeah, pretty much the same, same scheme. Good, thanks, Kristen. Uh, Jessica has a question. What's the importance of having a footprint with multiple locations around the country? And I'm sure both manufacturing and logistics are impacted by that. Either of you? Um. I'll, I'll jump, I'll start on that one. Thanks for the question. Uh, for us, our customers need that for a lot of reasons. Again, they're bringing in product from all over the world. Uh, they need it in, in, in sources and in, in areas fairly close to where they are. We're also seeing at, at, from a business continuity perspective, you know, the West Coast, our, our wonderful Phoenix facility, uh, the West Coast has a lot of uh, earthquakes and wildfires and, uh, and mudslides in, in California. A lot of California companies want, want product nearby, but they want it uh, east of the uh, San Andreas Fault, and they, they want it safe there. Uh, we're also seeing um, in pharma, and I guess in any manufacturing, there is some waste in raw materials unless they can balance the incoming product between facilities. So using an outsourced warehouse allows them to uh, break apart shipments and, and send certain, certain amounts to different manufacturing locations so they can better use those resources. So, you know, those are really the biggest reasons uh, that we see from our customers in, in having several locations. Good, good. Joanna? Yeah, I was just going to add to that. Um, in, the, in the biologics world, um, you know, cell banks are your critical raw starting material, right? And you should have those located in multiple locations, um, mm -hmm. West Coast, East Coast, Midwest. So really for business risk mitigation, there could be you know, earthquakes, there could be fires, and you want to make sure that your starting material is safe. Good. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, speaking of best practices, to the panel, uh, where would someone find, like, best practices for mitigating business risk? Uh, how do you deal with strategic and key partners who may leave a space, or we've been impacted by force majeure and there's been a tornado or hurricane or flood. How do we deal with those issues? Where do we learn more about best practices for this very specific space? Mm -hmm. I can kick off and, and say conferences and resources, resources like this panel today. Uh, Bio Week is probably a good source to network and really understand what the other risks are that companies are going through and who is available in the market. Um, you know, marketing and, and really reading the industry magazines and, and just understanding what resources are out there that can provide a solution maybe that was better than last year or better than something uh, that happened with one of your current customers. It's, it's always good. And I'll say this, even though it would involve my competition, but it's always good to talk to several companies and it's always good to have broad relationships with folks just in case, so. 
Thanks, Kim. So, and George, one thing to add to that, um, you know, when we talk about outsourcing and we're really focusing right now on operational outsourcing, but there's also our professional services partners, our attorneys, our accountants, um, our auditors. And those are the people who, um, if you're working with people that are specialized um, in our industry, they have seen as many things as you can think of. And so having good, strong professional counselors who are working with you are a tremendous resource um, and don't um, undervalue your insurance agent and your insurance underwriters. They can be phenomenal guides of things that you may need to think about. So, you know, in addition to our outsource partners, we also want to look at our professional services partners and tap into them um, for the expertise that you're paying them for. Great. Good point, Joan. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Chris. Um, marketing. Are there best practices for marketing when you're doing outsourcing? Are there ways that you have to worry about branding? And, and Kristen brought up labeling. Uh, Joanna mentioned uh, distribution issues. So to the panel, pick any part of that. How do you create best practices as you actually have a product getting it to market? Um, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll follow on there from what Joan was saying. It's really employ the experts right? It's another service. Uh, I have worked in many small and big pharma and marketing is the first to uh, really be outsourced so that the labeling, it's all, reg it's all um, regulated. Uh, you need to bring in your regulatory affairs group to make sure that you're doing what is required for the, um, the FDA, let's call it just the FDA, let's just pick on them. Um, and then really having a marketing team and a business strategy team, if the company is too small to support that and you're still going to market, that's great, but outsource that one. Um, and the, as the companies grow, normally that's a division that's built, you know, when we hit phase three clinical trials, um, because you're fairly confident that your product's going to market. I hope that answered some of the question. Thanks, Joanna. So I would say from the animal health um, perspective, um, a lot of echo there, um, but I would say in addition, sort of obviously the, I, I agree completely with the regulatory piece, right? Is your, we have really, really strict labeling requirements in animal health, especially on the food animal side, because the concern is if it's, if it's misused in any way, you have residual, you have big significant uh, food chain events there that happen. Um, and so, so starting with that, but um, and most animal health companies, the bigger animal health companies certainly have marketing departments. Um, but I would say, you know, a lot of even, even a pretty robust animal health marketing department is using a lot of external partners um, and frequently even running um, competitions, um, which is kind of fun um, is, you know, new branding, you know, come up with a new branding scheme for a new product that we have. And we'll actually run a competition through a couple of different um, 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 contract agencies. Um, and so. So it certainly isn't done all in-house. And I think that brings in variety. And certainly today with social media and all of the different, um, actually even customer segments, right? If you're thinking about over the counter and human or um, outside the, the veterinary channel versus in the veterinary clinic, very different sort of strategies that you're going to be utilizing there. And so you really need expertise way beyond what you could probably afford as an internal marketing team for, um, for sure. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to add to that something that is often forgotten and is often fun is actually naming new mm -hmm. products. <laughs> um, it, there are strict regulations, believe it or not, and people don't realize that if they haven't been in the industry for years. But that's, that's often a, a fun uh, adventure, um, just coming up with new names of products. But having an outside company help with that, too, uh, is very critical because they know what, what you can do and what you can't do with names. Very important. I learned about that one early as well. That was that was an eye opener. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I really couldn't figure out the marketing, so I went with a, a name I could remember. So I called the company Langham. <laughs> so, <laughs> we we, we do. see that occasionally here too. <laughs> yeah. I think Johnson and Johnson may have started a trend. I'm not sure. <laughs> we do use an outsourced. Uh, uh, 
marketing company for our business. And it is really helpful because we all as entrepreneurs and, and as business leaders have great ideas and we can we can write a general outline, but we really, yeah, you know, need some people who, with some expertise in the market to really put meat on the bone and really uh, do a great job uh, conveying the message and allowing us to do that final review of it, making sure we're getting the word out that does educate our clients and uh, add value to the market. Good point. It's amazing. Um, I'll just let that one go for a minute in case we get more questions about naming, because getting the expert involved early is a really good idea. And while Langham worked perfectly for you, someone else may want a very creative name and find out it doesn't resonate at all in the market and no one's going to be attracted to your brand. So using those professionals is important. CMC has been brought up at all levels today. Um, we mentioned there are so many aspects to CMC, but for young companies filing your IND or more mature companies getting to an NDA, BLA, and uh, what are some of the concerns that you need to be aware of as an entrepreneur dealing with CMC when you get to the intricacies of, of getting your product into a new market, getting it through approval process, and whoever would like to start? I, I'll jump in as the logistics company while... Um... Uh, anyone else is formulating their thoughts. So we're really not in the thick of things on CMC, but what we, where we add value is providing any information that our customers would need. Copies of SOPs and licenses and any, you know, quality audits or anything they need to get the information that would be helpful to them. So for it, thank you, Kathy. You know, we've I've always depended very heavily on my logistics companies and my three PLs for that very, you know, the final mile, um, really getting defining where we're storing and and the commercial holding uh, pen um, for the end game, George, for NDAs and BLAs. The the build for, of that document, that dossier, has really started right at the early development phase, and I always encourage my clients to plan their development really based on that dossier. They're going for a BLA or an NDA at the end of the day, and the development and the CMC needs to be built through the years so that um, there's no surprises at the end there. Um, really working through everything that has to be done from shipping validation, and you know, when are you going to put that in so you can actually validate your shipment to your logistics partner um, through to really building your talks, your animal studies right up front. Um, so I always encourage people to look at, you know, what's the CMC package going to be for your, for your commercialization and work backwards and make sure that everything is covered. Excellent point. Kristen, do you have anything else on that? Really from the animal health perspective, it, it pretty much exactly what Joanne just described, right? You're going to be working on that technical dossier um, as it is it at least at the point it's entering into early development. Um, and there really shouldn't be surprises because again, you've built out a project plan and strategy um, from um, submission approval um, and launch even all the way back um, to where you're, you're starting to work on that package. So um, I think one of the things that's interesting though, um, and it's a philosophical thing is you know, how much buffer do you put into your project plan, um, anticipating that you might get, um, you know, a rejection, more questions um, as that dossier moves through. And it's really not, at least in animal health, not unusual to um, iterate again uh, with the regulatory agencies. It's very unusual to have a first pass approval on a technical dossier. Um, and that's a little different. Obviously, we're talking EPA versus USDA versus FDA, but I'm talking mostly small molecule FDA right now as it would be very unusual to get a first pass. It does happen occasionally, but usually you need to kind of factor that in as well. Thanks. Most of us as entrepreneurs start with the idea, you know, we're working with reagent batches when we're doing early work and we don't need anything more. We don't need 95% purity yet. We've got to get all this stuff going. Where do engineering batches and the concerns about transfer, tech transfer of literally how to scale up your manufacturing, where do those questions start to arise and how, sh 
how soon should an entrepreneur start beginning the process of, okay, we're going to need to do this here. Here's what we have to do to scale. Whoever wants to weigh in first. Joanna, what's an engineering batch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, all right, so this is my life, right? Yes. <laughs> this is my life, which is planning um, the CMC strategy. Um, and really, you can't start too soon uh, developing that plan so that uh, from an entrepreneur's perspective, when do I need to raise money? You know, what scale do I need to get to? When am I going to be going into the larger tanks that are going to cost me millions of dollars? Um, and when am I, am I going to have to go out to my you know, venture capital people and, and say, okay, I need money in six months time, where is it going to come from? Um, if you lay that plan out uh, early on, uh, it may be a two year plan, right? Just to get to engineering lots. And an engineering lot really is your GMP scale, not run to GMP, but hopefully in the same facility. And so that you can iron out any process um, problems that you have before you launch into GMP. Um, you can use the engineering material for your large animal tox studies, um, as Kristen was talking about earlier. Um, and engineering normally comes after you've developed the process at small scale. So you've, if you're talking biologics, again, um, five liters, 20 liter lots, and then you can go up to your 100 liter for engineering or 200. Um, if you want to do engineering at your larger scale, that's fine, but it's going to cost you money, right? Um, the transfer and should be you know, an early transfer from your cell line development to your to your manufacturer or, or tech transfer later on if you need more capacity. Um, normally, phase one two clinical studies can be run at the smaller scale if your if your dosing isn't too high, um, and then tech transfer to a commercial manufacturer can occur much later on. Great, thank you. That's good insight. Anyone else? Okay, to that end, you've started to manufacture and you've got a great relationship and you realize that they're not gonna be able to scale up. What happens? What do you do? Uh, this is where your tech transfer, this is where you go out and you find somebody who has the, the scale that you need to meet market. Um, you don't want to do too many tech transfers. And so you go and find another CMO that has the same, the right capabilities, has the larger scale, and you go into uh, a tech transfer of your process. Um, there may be facility fit questions that you have to address. Maybe they have a piece of equipment which isn't exactly the same. Um, and then you have to develop your comparability studies to show that the material that's being made at the larger scale is in fact comparable to the material that you've been using in your earlier clinical trials. Um, the approach to this often is just analytical comparability, showing that analytically and chemically it's the same, structurally the product is the same, um, but there may be a request to do small clinical trial comparabilities as well, um, just to show that your scaled up product uh, has the same efficacy and safety as the material you've been using in your earlier phases. Brilliant, thanks Joanna. To, to that end, maybe panel, drug manufacturing files. What, in that case, where you're making that change, what should we as entrepreneurs have insured up front to, to move that file off to the next person? Are you talking about DMFs, George? Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, drug master, master files often used in the small molecule world. Uh, for a process. Um, it's really just making sure that that process is run the same. And, you know, some DMFs are held at the FDA that they are um, confidential to outside people. And really, you just lodge them with the FDA, and then they can do all the inspections based on that. Great. Good point. Anyone else on DMFs? Again, a little different terminology, um, different sort of schemes there with EPA versus FDA versus USDA on that. But there are outlines of USDA, you know, just using them as an example, outline of production, standard outlines that, that you would have filed and are agreeing to as you move along in the dossier process that then you would, they would, those would be your key documents that you'd be using if you were ser searching for a new uh, CMO sort of strategy. Okay. 
Good. Let me weigh in on something and, and Joanna or Kristen, correct me if I'm wrong here. I'm just looking at this from a transportation and logistics perspective, but I know we have worked with our customers, uh, especially the, the startup companies to have very specific SOPs by lane, by supplier into their facility and then to the customer. And these uh, are so specific in, in that business that um, it, it, it sort of ties us in with the customer because once they filed those uh, uh, master files, they are very reluctant to make a change, even in the transportation side of the house, because the, uh, everyone is so stringent on this. And weigh in for me, uh, uh, is, do you agree with that? Kristen, would you like to respond to that? Actually, I mean, I, that sounds like a lovely best practice, right? So yeah, I mean, I, not, nothing negative to say about that at all, right? Um, it, 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 I mean, that's excellent. I'm, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think that's necessarily always reality, but I think that would be, we, we would all aspire to do that. So yeah, nothing really to add. Put a big asterisk on that one. Good job. Kathy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a great coaching, Kathy. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right, um, if, Joan, are there any more questions from the audience we need to touch on before we wrap up? No, nope, I think it's time for closing thoughts. I would just say uh, there's a lot to think about and, and I think uh, either Christian or, uh, Kristen or Joanna said it earlier, it, 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 transportation and warehousing in the supply chain is sometimes an afterthought. So I would just suggest that you consider that and bring a partner in to the at the table early in the process just to make sure everything is covered. Logistics and transportation around pharma and temp controlled product is totally different than outside that. So there's a lot to think about, a lot to learn. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thank Kathy. Joanna. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. This has been a great discussion. Um, supply, you know, supply chain is just that word. It's getting the supply to clinical trials, to marketing patients, um, plan. Planning is key uh, and making sure that all parts of that supply chain are covered right up front. Um, it's been a great conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I, I just want to close with a little plug for animal health um, is, you know, <laughs> animal health is, is different. Um, it's got different rules and um, but also many commonalities to the human health space. Um, certainly we operate at different price points. We operate at different uh, definitions of blockbusters, um, but we have certainly different development costs. And um, I think it's certainly worth looking at um, as, a, as a biotech um, a startup company. Um, it, it's, it's not all super easy though. And sometimes people make it sound like that and it's just not. So, um, doesn't mean you can't do it. Doesn't mean it doesn't fit in your business plan and even in your investment strategy and in your company, but, um, but definitely do your homework. Um, and I think, again, if you're participating in this kind of event, um, you're doing your homework, right. And you're learning. And so, um, but, but welcome any, um, any reach outs to help you guys with that. So thank Great. you very much for having me. Thank you to our panel. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Joan, let's wrap it up. All right, and first of all, I really wanna thank George. Um, many of you may not know, but AZ Bio Peers actually originated out of a conversation that George and I had a couple years ago. And he's been very, very involved in putting this together from the very beginning and still sits on the advisory committee of CEOs that come up with the topics and work with our team, Dr. Patricia Beck Beckman and Dr. Natalie Mitchell, in coordinating all of these. So um, a big thank you to George and um, to all of our, our panelists today. It was a fascinating discussion and hopefully we'll have a chance to um, look at more of these in the future. And speaking of more of these in the future, um, I do wanna remind everyone of our upcoming AZ BioPeers sessions um, in um, July. Um, we're going to be looking at the convergence of healthcare and information technology. Um, things do not happen in silos anymore. And so we're really going to be focusing on what should be a fascinating discussion. Um, and then in August, we're going to be talking about human resources. Because when it comes to HR and benefits, 
Um, it is a key strategy for attracting and retaining talent. And we have some experts who are going to be able to talk with us on that um, before we go into the big um, season for getting quotes from our suppliers and getting ready for employee enrollment. So that's what's coming up in July and August. We will still be virtual. So if you decide to go up to the mountains or out to the beach, you can still join us. Um, again, thank you to our moderator, um, George Polberg, to our speakers, Kathy Langham, um, Joanna Ward, and Kristen Boynick. And um, thank you to all of you for doing what you do to make life better for people and for our four-legged friends um, all around the world. We'll be signing off and we'll see you next month on AZ Bio Peers. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. Bye-bye.